Hello and welcome to Mike Stand, a podcast by the Student Alliance for Nationalism and Democracy of the University of San Carlos. I am your host, Anne Cherise Rivera, with my co-host, Francesca Diane Lozano. For this episode, we are honored to be accompanied by a USC assistant professor. She was a fellow of the Cornelio Fayago Memorial Workshop, the Liga National Writers Workshop, the J. Elizalde Navarro National Arts Criticism Workshop, the ES National Writers Workshop, and the Critica Nacional Workshop on Art and Cultural Criticism. Her poems have been published both in local and national publications and awarded awards including the Jimmy Y. Balakwit Award for Poetry in 2009, the Vicente Renundo Literary Excellence Award in 2019, and as well as the Gawad Urian Best Music in 2020. Her first poetry collection, entitled Lawas, was published in 2016. Please help me welcome Ms. Cindy Velasquez. Thank you so much for having me here. Thank you also, Ms. She is here to provide her expertise on our subject matter today. Our topic for today will be interesting, inspiring, and informational. We will be talking about the role of art in political discourse. Art does not only provide us with a vessel for self-expression. Most of the time, these artworks aren't perceived in the same way. Each artwork is subject to unique interpretations from different viewers. Aside from self-expression, art is capable of encapsulating experiences, moments, and political events into tangible, audible, and perceptible materials that will soon be used to preserve our history and culture. In today's episode, we will further understand the relationship between politics and art. Hello, Mal. We'd like to ask you, how's your quarantine going? Kumusta ka yun? Have you eaten na ba? Uh, I usually have brunch instead of breakfast. I believe that the pandemic has somehow uh, changed. Also, uh, the way we are being online and the way we live, there is more freedom on the things that we do because we're also inside our house. But to tell you honestly, if you try to look at it differently, somehow it can be also in the other way around. You might think it's freedom because you have more things to do, but we're somehow like we cannot escape anymore the online life and somehow we're jailed to that one instead of having the freedom that we do. During the time that uh, if there's already pandemic, we thought we have more things to do, but we're somehow trapped actually in the online life. I don't know if you have the same way that I'm thinking, but that's what I am thinking right now. Yeah, I feel the same way as <laughs> So we'll start off with the question that is probably on the minds of all mga listeners right now. Liz. Is art political? Before we're going to uh, navigate that question, it would be better that we have to revisit the definition of art. So mm-hmm. art, basically, we can just summarize that one into three words. So you have material, organization, and evaluation. So materials are basically all things created by God. These are natural things. And then the organization is basically the, the human intervention. So these are the skills uh the experiences uh it can also be the the creative side of the artist enhancing the the material and then lastly there's an evaluation so evaluation can be good or bad so the evaluation is so important because uh, people will try doing an art but nobody will do the evaluation so let's just have a good example so assuming that there's a photographer And then he took a picture of the sunset. So the sunset there is our material. And then if you want to edit that one in the Adobe Photoshop using also the skills of the photographer, then that is and that is the human intervention. So basically that is the organization. And then if you're going to put that one in Facebook and then somebody click the like button, then therefore there's the evaluation. Or if not, (laughs) if somebody will comment, oh, I don't like this photo, like it's totally edited, then that can also be an evaluation. So again, evaluation can be good or bad. So going back to your question, now that we know what is art, um, if you try to look at it also, you can see that art is really compelling. It's really one of the potent things that you know people created. If you're going to look at it, we do actually artwork to express ourselves, correct? We always do that one, okay? Regardless of your... 
um, social status, gender, etc. Now, going back to that one, because we do that one, sometimes we really have to add our own experiences and what are the things that you want to speak or what are the things that we want to share. And you cannot stop a, a person doing an art form that can also be political. So the the best answer for that one is yes, of course. <laughs> or, okay, because uh, at the end of the day, always take note that you know people will have their own biases be- because we're we are coming from different backgrounds and we have different stories to narrate. So we are all storytellers. However, we have different way to approach or to share our stories to others, and we cannot help them if they will you know include something that will show also. Uh, what they're standing for. So, Miss, I agree that art is indeed subjective since no two people can respond to the same piece of art in the exact same way, no? But, okay. but on the other hand, the artists, like what you said, um, they have their own stories to share, no? And I guess that's what makes art objective. Like, they have their own stories to share to everyone. Mm-hmm. In line with what you said, Miss, a lot of consideration is placed into a single piece of artwork, Miss Not, especially if this artwork involves political references or messages. And yeah, absolutely. And speaking yeah. of the involvement of political references or messages, Miss, how do you incorporate politics with art? Okay, so that's very good because uh, I am actually a, a poet. So I've been doing this one ever since, uh, like really doing this one professionally after I graduated from college. And I really started with protest poetry. So uh, the reason for that one is that because after my graduation, there were a lot of news in Mindanao. And it's very essential that you will really write something about your time. When you do write, These are the two essential things that I always do. I write about my age, okay? Because if I do not write about my age, it will not also be sincere to people. So, for example, if you want to become a writer and you're only 14 years old, then write about being 14 years old. Or if you're already like me, I'm already in my mid-30s, then I will write about being a woman in her mid, um, mid-30s. And the second thing is I will really write about my time. And when I say time, what is current and what is important. So that was basically the, the two things that I always take note when I, I decided to become really a writer or a poet. So during that time, there were a lot of news in Mindanao. So I, I wanted to write about love because we have to start with that one. <laughs> the hugot, the hugot period, especially if you're, you know, you're starting being a writer. But I always think also that um, when you will write about your time people can also look at who we are if there will be people studying us in the past that's the one of the things that we have to take note so i started with that one and the very first thing that uh i did was after i decided to become uh, or i after i decided doing all the protest poetry uh i realized that I have also poems where in, instead of creating uh, division, uh, because when you do protest poetry, you, sh- you will never add fuel to the current fire already. Instead, do not try yourself to create division. You know, we have our own um, bruises as a nation, but we have to look for ways, you know, to be complete, even though the bruises are there. Okay, so if that is the case, we have to make sure also that at the end of the day, You will try, you know, through your poetry, try to help the nation to be united somehow. Because, of course, we cannot do that one. We are living in an archipelago. We have a lot of ethnolinguistics. We have a lot of languages. So difficult to do that one. But if we have one common goal to be united, then we can really do that one. Second thing is that when you do also protest poetry, uh, you have to be very careful of your words. Take note that in writing poetry, it's a short amount of words, but you really still have to filter the words that you will place in your poetry because uh, at the end of the day, writing a protest poetry can be one of the ways to create 
a, a discourse or giving another perspective. But the main intention really of a protest poetry is to really create um, unity instead of, you know, um, division by providing another perspective, okay, of what is going on in the community or a nation. So, we're gonna do the Eka, just start a great poetry, man. Yes, yeah, somehow. When I was still in high school, I wrote poems, but kind of ma- pa kasi yung poems. Oh. <laughs> so, it was only after college that uh, I said to myself na magsulat ko, hindi lang tungod for the sake of writing, but magsulat ko because it is essential. And a lot of us, if you will start to become a, a poet, you will really go to the period of writing love poems, right? So, ang nakanindot lang, but I'm still doing it. Might be a different form of, you know, a love poems, but uh, karon mangood, there are more things that you need to revisit or you need to rediscover. Okay, but I'm not saying also that we will not explore the emotions. Okay, uh, it really just depends on the current time. Alright, so kanina you mentioned protest poetry. Its main goal is to create unity. Yeah. Not division. So, oh, oh. You mentioned also that you have been a poet for a while now. Would it be okay if we asked you to give us an example of, of like your poems? Yes, of course. All right. So Miss Cindy has sent us a copy of her poem entitled "Unsaon Pagkaon sa Impierno." We'll be playing it right now. Saun, pagkaun, sa imperno. Sukara ang kahadlok sa init ng kaha. Aron imong isula sa tukot ng panggobyerno. Ibutang sa imong plato samtang na ay mga yawa sa imong atubangan. Kinamuta, ug usapa, hangtud mabusog ka, uban sa mga bala. Hay, dili na uso ang tinitur o ang kutsara. Mauna, kaon na lang, kaon na lang diha. Kung ikaw mapulan, sa imong sudan uy ang kahadlok pwede ba ya sidian ani apa man sad ang hilaw nga paglaom ug isawsaw lang sa bahaw nga kalinaw ug kung ikaw mapaso Yaw kalimut o pag-ampo. Well, can I say, oh, Miss, what inspired you to write that piece? Like? I think that was, I, I, I wrote that one way back in 2009. And during that time, there were a lot of... Uh, like deadly news in Mindanao. If you try to look at it, the eating is an essential part, right? We do that <laughs> one. And for us Filipinos, uh, when we gather, we gather actually because of food, right? And that's, that's also one of the ways for us to bond, right? But in this case, I use that that, that essential part to uh, create a metaphor or this atmosphere of, mm-hmm. um, you know, uh, conflict of what's going on in in Mindanao and if you notice it like there were words like uh, I mean lines like bahaw nga kalinaw dukot nga bang goberno if you're going to listen also to my voice it's it's really not me it, it was so different <laughs> even me myself <laughs> uh, so 
if if you try to uh, to experience that that poem you can also feel the the emotions or those voices of people who were in Mindanao during that time so at the end of the poem although the poem is quite heavy and even though it's short it's really heavy although we know that in the philippines we have islam uh, and we have catholicism but all of us we pray uh, and then that's one of the things that we can see like a common ground to our nation so bisag muslim ka or kristiano ka or lumad ka pareho kitang tanan nga magampo so, knowing also the that particular conflict and the reason also that the poem is quite short okay it's because when you do write a poem that is short you will give more room for the for the audience or for the people listening to the poem to think about it or to reflect kay ang mubo mang good nga balak or shorter poems not all things are there uh, dili tanan gibutang ang detalye dili tanan gibutang sa writer so ikaw ang muad ana depende sa imong pagsabot so you're also becoming like critical and you're thinking of 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 the work itself you're not just there as a spectator okay like you're also there to to be part of you know experiencing it yourself kay ang ang balak magod ang iyang ang iyang main intention kay ang iyang unspoken part so tinaguan man gina in the layers of words and poetry the the clues are actually hidden and then eventually if you're going to really experience the poem then there will be a revelation it's like in you know, mga mystery books but like you know, uh, there's a killer Okay, and you're looking who is the, the killer. Poverty is also like that. Like if there's something that you want to say, you try to you try to hide it through the layers of words, and then at the end, but still you're giving clues of what is the poem all about. It's the same thing also, and then eventually you will know the killer. Okay, but the reader will have to experience it through some of the the clues placed in there. So. That's basically that. That's one of the things that you can find that is common in creating suspense novel or you know m- mystery novel. When oh, that's the same thing also when you're doing a poem. Going back to what you said, Miss Katong, uh, imohang poem. When mm-hmm. people listen to this, they can really feel like they were literally in the moment experiencing what the. People in Mindanao were experiencing. Mm-hmm. Honestly, when I do write a poem, I always, I always want to read it or to perform it, because if you're going to trace the history of the Philippines, particularly in the literature, we started with oral traditions, uh, like for example, um, like the Tigmo, the Balitao. Balitao is a, a debate between a man and a woman. It's a song and dance, but it is actually meant to be. You know, you have to perform it orally. And even in in Manila, they have the balagtasan, right? So you have the or- orality of, um, y- you know, we have the orality of uh, of poetry. That's why uh, there was a time uh, there was this height of performance poetry, right? But honestly, we've been doing that one <laughs> like flip top. Are you familiar with flip top? So uh, we're actually doing that one ever since, uh, you know, in our culture and. The reason why I don't just want to uh, to publish the work, instead really perform it. And if sometimes if if there's no way for me to perform, just simply read it, is so that the people can really experience the poem deeply. It's it's a different experience when you read the poem. It's a different experience. But when you will see the person performing the poem. It's another experience because all the senses are there, so you can hear the person, you can you can feel, you can see the person, okay. Especially if it's like uh, before the pandemic when there are performance poetry or poetry reading, you can really experience it. So that's one of the things also that I miss about um, uh, poetry when you read it and when you perform it. I actually miss watching live performances, miss, because there's this connection you feel with the artist and with the poem itself bummer. yes and it's amazing this how everything happening now will soon become pages in history books or paintings yes. in music yes i agree so 
uh, art indeed plays a huge role in preserving our culture and yes. politics for future generations. Yes, I agree to that. And you know what's the good thing if we continue the the practice of like doing spoken poetry. I don't know if you notice it, but uh, uh, when you do protest poetry, it's actually a collaborative work of many diverse people. Like for example, if there's somebody who's a poet. Uh, right now, th- you can do pro- uh, you can do uh, spoken word poetry like video. Okay, so it's a it's a it's a project between a poet and a videographer, or uh, let's just say spoken word and painting, or spoken word and music, spoken word and photography. So it's really a collaborative work, and the more you d- you combine, let's just say you combine two arts, it is more powerful, especially if you want to do. Uh, like your the intention is the you know political change or if you want to to do uh let's just say you want to add another perspective of the issue okay so uh, that can be one of the the best ways to do it like the combining of two arts mm. so there's really a huge future especially where we're already in the in the time of technology it can really flourish oh miss i agree by the way miss um May we ask why you've chosen to write in Bisaya? Ah yes. Uh, uh before writing, uh, before I decided to write, uh, particularly in Bisaya, I was also writing in English. I'm still writing English, but when I do have an idea, uh, let's just say I'm, I would like to write a poem, I will try to analyze first the situation of the poem. So, for example, I want to write a poem about the carbon market. I believe I cannot fully express it, like sen- all the senses, by using the English language. That would be that would be a, a huge challenge for me. So the best way to do it is really like you know to write in in Cebuano. Let's just say in the poem, there's this little child, and that little child got lost in the carbon market. Mm-mm. So how will you how will you write okay that that story or narrative, like? like sincere and then you can also see the culture of the Cebuano okay so it would be better to rewrite it in in our language but believe it or not there are also writers who are doing that one like there are Cebuano writers writing in English but even if their works are in English you can feel the the the, the essence of being a Cebuano even though the, the the choices I mean the choice of words they're in the English language one thing also that I want to add, if you're planning to become a poet and uh, you are quite concerned of what language you will use, I suggest you use only the language that you know how to, to use it well, like you master it well. So, for example, uh, if you're not really good in Cebuano, then try not to not write uh, in Cebuano. If you're only good in English, then, then write in English. Okay, so... But if you really want to use a certain language, then you have you have to make sure that you you master it. And it also takes time to master the Cebuano language, although it's our mother language. If there are Cebuanos who are listening right now, believe it or not, there are a lot of words that are also difficult because we're not using some of the words. And this is also one of the reasons why I really want to 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 perform, to write, or to read a poem. Um, in Cebuano, because at the end of the day, if the language will not be used, eventually it might it it will not survive. So, but I am not saying and not forcing <laughs> to to you know to use the language. Just use the language that you you know that you can really navigate well, or you can you know you know that you are master of that particular language. That's actually an eye opener, Miss Kai. I I just realized that mm. we never really learn our Bisaya language in school, and mm. we learn it through language acquisition. And we don't formally learn our language in school, but through conversing with people. Correct. Okay. That's what you said previously, Miss. If the language isn't used, then in the long run, it's gonna disappear or. Mm. Um, Mm-mm. And since Bisaya is commonly used in Visayas and in some parts of Mindanao, the Bisaya language carries our culture with it by creating art pieces 
And in this case, spoken poetry, these would really last for generations. And I think that's a really great way to preserve our culture and Bisaya language. Yes, yes, absolutely. Well, I agree with Gomez. Like, it's very important to keep our dialect alive, especially mm-hmm. in a country like here in the Philippines. Nga, almost every other island kay lain-lain mm-hmm. ato ang mga like, datong dialects. Na happy ko yun kay like, I've heard daw nga the younger generations, the ones after sa Amua kay, they're taking up daw a subject in school called MTB. Mm-hmm. Tapos it's Bisaya daw. Yeah. Yes. Oh, but it's not too late. For example, you're in your mid twenties or early twenties, mm-hmm. or even like like me in, in my mid thirties, and you want to write in Cebu. No, for me, it's not too late. For example, you can read. Uh, newspapers in Cebuano. For example, you go to the mass and then instead of searching for English mass, you can have the Cebuano mass. At least you can be able to hear the language and experience the language because in reality, uh, in our present time, we have already siblings. And kana, muna yung usa sa mga butang nga ato yung itake note kay ang paggamit nato sa language mga dili na siya pure. Um, kasagaran kita kung mo-converse na sago gud siya English og uh, Cebuano. Di siya pa nang straight, no? So, kana usa sa na so para maka-experience ka og mas modak mo wide nang imong vocabulary, kana ma- mangita kag paagi nga uh, makakita kag materials in Cebuano. So it's not too late if you want to really write in Cebuano. Mm. Oh, you hear that guys, it's never too late to learn. <laughs> yeah. In art, it's never too late. Age will never matter. Okay, it will not matter if you want to become an artist, especially if there's an art form that, uh, let's just say, painting. Oh, yeah. You might think, ah, I'm too old for that. No, you're not too old for that. Do you have any advice, ba, or like words of encouragement for the new generation of artists who are interested to raise political discourse through their art? Yeah, I think I'll give probably like. Two things. So number one, you have to be responsible with the intention because take note. Once you will uh, share your art to the world, okay, it's open for criticism, and you have to be very responsible to that. And how to do it? You filter it before you share it to the world. You can edit it. You can look for uh, a mentor. You can look for an editor. Okay. You can ask uh, a good friend who is also into that kind of art. So always filter because take note as what I have told you. Art, in terms of political, you know, uh, discourse, it's actually meant for us to be united. Okay. It's a remedy for us. And how to do it? By giving another perspective to the situation, okay? Because once you will give another perspective, it can be one of the ways for the other party to understand the other party as well. So you're giving two sides of the points. So that's the reason why when you do, uh, well, let's just say, uh, a protest poetry, you're giving, you're trying to have, you're trying to share, okay? The other story nga, wala nila nakita. Okay? So that's it. You ha- And you have to do it very well. Okay, be responsible by filtering. And then the second one also that I would like to share to the young artists and you're really planning to become, uh, you want to uh, to share your thoughts, your ideas, okay, to the world. Try also to know your identity very well, okay? Especially if you're, you're young, you know, uh, searching for identity is very important because once you know your identity, then it's easier for you to write. Uh, What do you mean by this? We're actually living in this world where in the shaping of our identity is more of the external factors. Like for example, social media. So we change ourselves depending or we're molding ourselves based on the outside forces, not really on, you know, trying to reflect who really we are and what we can share to others. So it's important to become very authentic, especially right now, because there are a lot of factors that will Um, you know, somehow change or probably shaken the molding of your identity. And as what I have told you, uh, searching for identity is not just a one-time project. It's a forever project. <laughs> okay, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a challenge for you to do every day. And if you can master that searching, if you can master, you know, in 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 knowing your identity well, okay, 
um, then you can become really a good uh, artist. Okay? Because you know already how to control your biases. You know already how to listen. Okay? Because listening is very important when you communicate as an artist. To listen more than to speak more. Okay? So, that's it. To summarize it, number one, you have to be responsible. Okay? Know your intention. Filter it. Okay? And if you want to add a discourse, then ask yourself if this is the right thing to do. You research it well. And then the second one is that know yourself, okay? Like, know your identity. Like, start being a Filipino or a Cebuano, okay? Because it's your anchor. And once you can do that one, once you have the two, then it's easier. Uh, if you notice on the two things that I shared, I did not talk about how to write well or how to become a good artist, but more on the values and principles. Mm -hmm. So kinda, that's the very essential. Do that one first. And then eventually, the technical aspect, you can just really do it later. Okay? Wow, that was very insightful. Thank you. All right. Thank mm -hmm. you, Miss Cindy Velasquez, for the joining Islamat us today. As we talked about art and political discourse, I've actually learned a lot in this podcast. Art can be summed up in three words. First, material, which is all things created by God. Second, organization, which is human intervention towards the material, like skills, experiences, and the creative side of the artist. And third, and the last, Evaluation, which is the most important since this may be good or bad and this is also how other people would perceive the art. Right. And I also learned that art is inclusive regardless of a person's social status, regardless of his or her gender. It is still a means for us as humans to express ourselves, including where we stand, for example, politically. And in turn, you can't stop a person from doing an art form that is also political, since the purpose of art is actually to be loud and to make people feel uncomfortable. Art is indeed political, whether we like it or not. That's actually a great insight, and in line with that, I remember now, Miss mentioned that we have our own bruises as a nation, but we have to look for ways to be complete even though the bruises are still there. Art is utilized to spread imaginative awareness. Right? That's actually so very well thought out. And we also got to learn why there's a reason that some, if not most, poems are short. The shorter the poem, the more room there is for the listeners to reflect upon the meaning of it. And it allows for them to be immersed in the layers of the unspoken words in the poetry. For our listeners who are new to STAND, STAND has participated in various movements and protests that are in line with their values. STAND has always been working hard to spread awareness on various issues, especially in informing not just the students, but like also the masses well, especially the students, actually, about the current issues and the, and the events and what's happening beyond the walls of our institution. STAND is not only a political party, but also a mass organization that strives to help eradicate injustices present in our society, since we believe that students and the masses are both very powerful, especially when united. Thank you to the Carolinians for listening to our episode today and also to everyone else listening today. To access more of our podcast episodes, stay tuned next month where we talk about the heroes that are and aren't. Who are the real-life heroes? And are the heroes we learn about in history books actually heroes? Or better yet, what characteristics makes an ordinary person a hero? Well, we'll all find out next month. You may send your questions to us on our Facebook page at Student Alliance for Nationalism and Democracy dash University of San Carlos. This has been Anne Cherise Vera and Francesca Diamozano with Miss Cindy Velasquez. Let us always be reminded that the greatest victories can be achieved with the mobilization of the Filipino masses and its students. <laughs>